there are times when we look at the Buddha's teachings and it all seems so cut and dried, neat lists for everything. But if you start looking at the lists, you begin to realize that they move around. You read one list and everything is nicely ordered out so that step A leads to step B and then C and D and so down the line. And then you read another list where D has moved up to the front, A has moved back to the back. And other things are brought in. Some things are left out. And you begin to realize that things are not so cut and dried after all. There's wiggle room, room to play, room to improvise. So when we look at the teachings, remember they're basic principles general principles, but in applying them in detail, we've got to use our own ingenuity, our own ability to read what's working and what's not. And if something is not working, can you think up another way of applying the principles that would work? In other words, you don't throw out the principles, but you explore them. You learn about them. As a John Lee once said, the ways of the mind are so many, there's no way any book could ever contain them all. That doesn't apply just to one-volume books. In the canon, we've got 45 volumes, and it still doesn't contain all the ways of the mind. So learn to appreciate this quality of ingenuity and try to develop it. It's one of the qualities the Buddha said you should look for in yourself as you practice and consciously try to develop it. There's nowhere where he defines it. The Pali word bhadibhana shows up but in a lot of places as a good quality to have. Then it's something you want to learn to develop together with your learning. The things you've read, the things you've heard. That's one level of discernment. But then as you try to develop these things in the mind, That takes things to a whole new level, because sometimes what seems very simple as it's written down becomes a lot more complex when you actually try to apply it, especially as you try to apply different principles. On the one hand, there's the principle of goodwill, which the Buddha encourages you to have for everybody. But at the same time, he says you have to be very selective in your friends. Be very careful to hang out with people who are virtuous, don't engage in unskillful actions, don't engage in unskillful speech, are generous, wise, convinced of the possibility that we can gain awakening, we can gain release through our own efforts. Those are the kind of people you want to hang around with. So having friendly thoughts for everybody is very different from being actually having somebody as your friend. And at the same time, the Buddha says you don't want to get too entangled with people. So you've got to learn how to balance those things out, sort them out, tease them out. To see the best way to apply them. And then the same principle applies as we're sitting here with our eyes closed. Try to stay with the breath. And on the one hand, you want to be as fully aware of just the sensation of the breath as you can. And then on the other hand, you want to be evaluating things, noticing how things are going. Is the breath a comfortable place to stay? Is it an interesting place to stay? What can you do to make it more comfortable? What can you do to make it more interesting? And John Lee has lots of suggestions. There are lots of there are some suggestions in the in the canon.
but you want to try them out. See what way of focusing on the breath works for you right now. And as a meditator, you want to develop a repertoire of skills. So that in days when the mind is frazzled, you have the right way of breathing for that mind. On days when it's tired, you have the right way of breathing for that mind. On days when it's scattered about, what way of breathing is best for that mind? These are things you want to learn through exploration. How much thinking and observing is good, how much of simply allowing the mind to be still is good. These are things you learn through trial and error. So it's more of an art than a science, in the sense that you have some freedom. And it's important that you exercise that freedom. All too often we think of insight as learning how to force the mind into a mold. The books say you want to see this insight, you want to see inconstancy and stress, not self. And if you make up your mind you're going to see things in that way, it's possible to make yourself see things that way. Or at least to have a good imitation. The question is, is that imitation really helpful? The whole purpose of these things is not specifically to brainwash you or to get you to agree to a certain set of propositions. It's more to see what's going on in the mind, to see where you're creating suffering and how you can stop. And particularly since we have such a passion for creating suffering or holding on to things that make us suffer. We want to learn how to apply the the basic principles of the Buddha's teachings to help develop some dispassion for that, so we can let go, can stop this continual production of suffering, and manufacture suffering all the time. How can we begin to see that it's not really worth it? So that's what those perceptions are for, sometimes seeing that all these things that you're holding on to are inconstant and unreliable. Sometimes that really hits home. Other times it's the insight into the stress, that they're like a disease, an arrow that's been shot into your heart. And who's doing the shooting? You're doing the shooting. Why do you do it? Because you're not really paying attention. You don't see the connections. Sometimes it's the perception of not-self or the perception of emptiness. There are lots of different ways of developing a sense of dispassion. And the tools are there not so much that you say, oh yes, this is the way things are, in constant stressful not-self, what's next? That's not the point. The point is try to get the mind still enough so it can really see what's going on, and then figure out a way of developing dispassion. Now to see what's going on, you've got to see connections between cause and effect, and this is how the improvisation comes in. Your own ingenuity comes in here. You try this and watch what happens. Then you try that and watch what happens. Years back when I was reading Kurt Vonnegut, I came across a passage where he says, like scientists are like little kids. They like to play around. So they've been lucky that as they grow up, they can find someone to pay them to play around. And that's how we develop knowledge. So it's the same with the breath. Play with the breath. Experiment. Deeper breathing, shorter breathing, more shallow breathing, longer breathing. Think of the breath coming in and out through all your pores. Think of it coming in and out specific parts of the body that tend to be starved of breath energy. Notice how different ways of breathing affect the state of your mind, how they affect your general health.
the basic principles are there in the books, but the, the lessons you learn are lessons you're going to learn on your own. The Buddha is simply teaching you how to explore. It gives some general criteria for knowing when you've hit, come across something really good. But it's not a matter simply of following instructions. You follow the instructions, and if something doesn't work, you adjust things here, adjust things there, see how much adjusting falls within the principles and how much adjusting takes you beyond them. And it's in your willingness to explore that you can learn. I had a student one time who insisted that he wanted to be told just what to do. Perhaps he'd read too many stories of the, the young student who goes to see the old master, and the old master says, Ah, yes, you need to focus on this. That's all the student has to do. Just focus on that, and boom, guaranteed awakening. But if meditation did have foolproof methods like that, we'd still be fools. And you never learn to take responsibility for yourself. You never learn how to think outside the box. Remember, the Buddha himself wasn't thinking in the box as he explored the way to awakening. He exhausted all the possibilities that everybody had taught at that time. And then he had to try other things. And it's finally it was when he was willing to think outside the box and realize, well, maybe that state of concentration, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation, maybe that might be the path. So he tried it. Remember, that there's a question mark there. Could this be the path? And even though there was that conviction that it could be the path, he had to test it. And when you have that testing mind, then, then then you know when something passes the test or doesn't pass the test. Those methods that tell you, okay, do this and don't think and just follow the method. When you get a result, you have to take it to the teacher, and then the teacher will tell you yes or no. And again, you're not being responsible. You're not held responsible. It's the techniques that give you some specific instructions so you know that you're not totally lost but also give you enough room to be responsible and encourage you to test things. When the results come, you'll have the ability to judge, are these really good or not? That's why this quality of ingenuity, improvisation, using your imagination, is absolutely central to the path.